Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next instalment of our Quantum Leap business show and event going around the world, 24 hours non-stop. And my next guest is a lady that uh, knows a thing or two about wine. So those of uh, you out in the hospitality business, uh, uh, perhaps even tourism, uh, should enjoy this uh, immensely. So uh, um, without further ado, let's, uh, let's crack on. So Emma, welcome to the program. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Emma, not that it should make any difference, but you were the first female to win the UK Winemaker of the Year Award, and not only once, but twice. What, uh, what makes a great winemaker? Well, uh, slight correction. I was, there was one other woman who has won it once before, but I'm the first woman to have won it twice. There we yep. go. <laughs> yeah. um, I would say good winemaking is 90% logistics, organisation and cleaning. The other 10% is what differentiates the good from the, from the great. And uh, I think that's, you, it's all about the tasting. It's all in the nuances of, of the palate when you're tasting different tanks, different wines and coming up with the blends, etc. cetera. Um, so yes, it's, it's being able to read a young wine and, and, and look at it and tell what it, how it's going to develop into the future. Yep. And that's, uh, I guess, a, a learnt skill that you can't get out of a book. No, you can't get out of a book. You, you can learn all the facts and figures about bottle it, about winemaking and all the rest of it, but you cannot learn it um, um, from a book. Um, so yes, you have to, you just, it's just practice. Yep. So uh, Emma, you, most people have a, what I call a sliding doors moment in their lives when, you know, they could have gone left and they went right, or they could have ducked when they should have bobbed. Um, what was your moment and what caused you to enter the wine business in the first place? Well, there, there were two, two sliding doors moments that happened very, very close together. One of them was um, failing my A-levels at school and getting rejected by every university I applied to. So I carried on working in the restaurant, that I, a pub restaurant, that local pub and restaurant that I've been working in since I was 15. Um, and because I didn't go to university at 19, I found myself working there when they had a big dinner serving some Krug champagne, 1979 vintage in a Jeroboam. And I was the wine waiter. And I, um, I got to taste the wine at the end of the night or after I'd finished pouring for the guests. And that wine just blew me away completely. And I can still taste it today. And I've never looked back. And I'm, now I'm working as a sparkling winemaker um, in you know 30 minutes from that very pub. So oh, <laughs> so. Wow. so uh, education is not everything. So those, uh, you know, I, I speak on a lot of topics around the world and, you know, you can't get a decent apprentice for love and the money nowadays. Everybody wants to be a brain surgeon. So not everybody can be an AI expert or, or robotics or whatnot, and nor do we need them all. So there's yeah. a wide variety of different things that uh, people can get into. Emma, I'd say, yeah, definitely, yeah, yeah. Emma, you know, you're in probably a, what's traditionally been, uh, for no reason, uh, a, a fairly male-dominated arena. So, and, and uh, you know, ladies and equality and diversity and all sorts of things are very uh, topical at the moment. W were there any particular challenges being a lady that, that, uh, that, in, that you encountered in, in, a, in this uh, field? Uh, well, I've been in the wine trade as a whole since I was, you know, a teenager. So back in the 90s, yeah, it was a very different world. I mean, I can remember being chased around the restaurant, chased by the head French head waiter, um, you know, trapped in the big cold room fridge by the Italian sous chef, you know, that kind of thing. You sort of expected it, <laughs> learned how to deal with it. Um, and uh, and I, I was I was supposed lucky if you like that I never nothing serious ever happened to me but uh, it there was a constant low level kind of harassment in the restaurant trade definitely in the wine business itself when I was in working in the trade in London I'd guess it's very old boy network up there in, at the time back in the nineties uh, and yes you you did meet some some challenges along the way but the one thing I will say about the production industry in the UK is it's very, very equal between men and women. It's still very white, definitely. It's not diverse in terms of ethnic background, but it's, um, and there's a split between men and women. It's very, very equal, I'd say, because we don't have any traditions. 
absolutely none at all. And I did, I would say <laughs> the most culturally challenging place I've ever worked was rural northern Tasmania. <laughs> <laughs> that was hard. I have to say that was really hard, but uh, for, for all sorts of reasons, but um, being back in England, surprisingly, because our industry is so young and so new, um, everyone's sort of go, got a fair go at it, so, which is great. Yep, brilliant. So Emma, um, British wines have been really roaring in the past decade or so <laughs> uh, compared to you know what it was even perhaps 20 years ago. Why is that? Well, first of all, Technically, they're called English wines. British okay. wines are something a bit different, but um, uh, so it, yeah, English wine, British wine. Let's let's not let's not get too bogged down in that. Um, it um, it's about in the nineties, uh, late eighties, early nineties. A couple of people realised that rather than these weird hybrids and German varieties that we were planting and making fairly thin acidic wines from, maybe we should start looking to Champagne because um, they've made a whole very successful industry out of making high quality sparkling wine from what are effectively underripe grapes. So we, someone, someone back in the day had this idea, this revelation, and uh, everyone, you know, we've all followed along since, but it is a very young industry. Um, and we've, we've really just discovering what we can do here in England. Um, and it is the, the best wines at the moment are still the high quality sparkling wines in the style of champagne um, and also there's an increasing professionalism within the industry there's a lot more training there's a lot of on-the-job training um, and people you know getting experience around the world and coming back and bringing that back to the to the country and uh, and uh, investing their expertise as well as other people investing money in, into the into the business yep so Emma, you know, you're, uh, you're involved with uh, Hattingley uh, Valley Wines. Uh, what's uh, your why story? People love the why in, <laughs> in businesses uh, and uh, it's always a fascinating uh, uh, question and, and an even more fascinating response usually. Well, it, I don't own the business. It belongs to a chap called Simon Robinson. He was a city lawyer um, and that's what paid for the what you can see behind me um, that's just a small part of the operation um, so he but he um, he put the money in had the inspiration he found me 2008 just after he planted his vineyard at the time I'd just come back from Tasmania where I'd been working and to be honest I I hadn't um, really got the experience to build a winery on this scale but Simon didn't know that, and I didn't know that either. So I just said, yeah, sure, I can do that. Um, and at the time, it was going to be a relatively small winery, but because he just wanted to diversify on his farm. He had some old chicken sheds. He, what, what am I going to do with them? Um, and we ended up knocking everything down and starting um, from scratch. And we're now one of the biggest wineries in the UK. Um, so, yeah, he, he just fancied having a vineyard. And now it, this is the monster we've created. <laughs> And, and getting bigger uh, by looking at all the awards you've been winning and all sorts of other things that are happening. So uh, yeah. <laughs> and for all the people out there in uh, talking about awards, and, and there are a lot of businesses out there that uh, enter into awards and accolades of some kind, irrespective of what sort of business it is, how do you go about positioning a great award-winning bid, if that's the process? <laughs> Well, most of the competitions we enter, International Wine Challenge, Decanter, uh, Champagne and Sparkling Wine World Championships, those big international competitions, as well as the National Wine GB competition, they're all judged on blind tasting. So you don't make a bid as such because you enter your wine into the category that you're, that you're qualified for. They're all blind they're already, they're all served to the judges completely blind. Some of the competitions are better than others. Um, so you don't actually have to make a bid as such. You just enter your wines, pay your fee, um, and then hope for the best. What we have found though, is that some competitions we tend to do better in than others. So then you start slimming down the number of competitions you enter because you don't want to get just a highly commended or not rated um, for a wine that then got a gold medal in another competition. So we then start to say, right, well, we never do very well in the sommelier wine awards, but we always do really well in the international wine challenge, for example. So let's forget that one and we'll just concentrate on entering on the ones that where 
they have different judges and they have different panels and they have different methods of do, approaching the judging, but um, it just seems to be consistent as to which competitions we do better in um, than those that we don't. So. Uh, so it's nothing like Eurovision where uh, some countries have already got it organised before they start the competition. No, no. To be fair, to be fair to all these competitions, that it really they really do, uh, you know. And I, I've taken part in a few judging competitions in the past, um, and it is pretty strict and very stringent. And you never know quite what you're tasting. So you might know the country that you're tasting from, but you won't know anything else about the wine. Yeah. yeah. So as a as a an expert in your field, what do you look for in a in a nice wine? What are what are the one or two things that, if it's not your wine what uh, what do you generally look for well do you want to take a second sip from the glass that's the first thing and then if once you finish that glass do you really want to have another glass <laughs> um and i get i get a lot of free wine in my line of work i get i get given bottles i swap bottles you know i get to go to lots of well in normal times i get to go to lots of tastings and dinners and things so you know the, the key for me is would i spend my own money on that wine <laughs> that's what makes it yep that, yeah. That's what differentiates for me um, a, a, a wine that I that really appeals to me, and it, it's got to be drinkable, and it's got to be appropriate for what you're doing. So, you know, you don't want um, an aromatic white wine to go with your steak or your roast beef on a Sunday. So you've got to, you know, you've got to give the wine a fair chance as to in the situation that you're in as well. Um, so there's no hard and fast rule. It's just, do I like this? Do I want to? drink more of it and would I spend money on it <laughs> good answer mm. so uh, I talk a lot about connections and collaborations uh, do you have any instances that you can share that uh, that you've had success with uh, with with any of uh, those sort of activities I'd say this whole business has been built on collaboration right from the word go um, Simon my my boss the owner of the business he is He's always had a very collaborative approach in terms of how the you know we get everybody in the team involved in all the blending. Um, as we get bigger, it's, it gets a bit more tricky and a bit more unwieldy. But um, we do we do um, you know we, we do work with the whole team to to make lots of the decisions. Um, but the key thing I think is that our partnerships with other vineyards because we have a very small vineyard of our own that we manage and run here. But most of the land here is not that suitable immediately around where we are is not that suitable for growing grapes so I spotted that quite early on and I realized I was going to need to um, find a supply of grapes from elsewhere and one of the ways we do that is working in partnership with local vineyards or well, vineyards all over the country um, and one of the ways we take grapes from them is what we call a swap deal so we take all of their grapes and we will keep a percentage for it that goes into that we can use however we want in our blends um, and then we'll make their percentage for them so no money changes hands um, and we get really good quality fruit because they don't know which bit of the percentage they're getting back there's no cherry picking allowed you know it's a this is a split we split it down at this point and then you take that I take this um, so they have they're incentivized to grow the very best grapes they can and we're incentivized to make the very best wine we can from those grapes because we're both going to get a share of them um, and at, at, at any stage until the blending we don't know which share is going where so so it's a it is a real collaborative approach um, and that work and it works really well for us yeah brilliant uh, brilliant example i think i've done a little bit of that uh, trading in uh, in my day the batman um, didn't like it though I can tell you uh, that <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah great great example of uh, uh, where you have the opportunity instead of to compete to collaborate and you get one plus one equaling three. So uh, uh, great, uh, great thoughts there. Mm -hmm. So Emma, the uh, established wine growing regions like Champagne and Beaujolais and La Rioja, Tuscany, they've all had established brands over a long, long, long period of time. What's your brand uh, building strategy? Because there's a lot of businesses out there that you know, they're web designers or dentists or whatever it happens to be, and they're competing against uh, uh, rivals like you do. So how, how do you go about that? What would be a couple of tips? Well, it's, it is difficult. So this is a very small industry. We're a very niche product. We're a luxury product. Apart from some of our newer, more innovative products, our, our entry level sparkling wine is, is 30 pounds a bottle. So we're, we're heading, we're looking for the sort of the premium market. Um, 
but there are champagnes got that wrapped up you know good and proper um, we are competing directly with high level champagnes so there's no doubt about that there are a couple of other wineries in the uk um, I'll, I'll name drop a couple nye timber uh, they go for the high-end luxury image and they've got the money behind them to do that and then someone like oh, uh, chapel down for example over in kent they are known more for much better uh, lower lower value wines you know sort of around the 15 to 20 pound mark um so more approachable more uh, I don't know, easier to easier to access we're somewhere in the middle so we we can't compete on either scale we can't compete on price with chapel down and we can't compete on the marketing budget with night timber so we're going for a slightly more quirky image what Gareth, our commercial director, what he's looking for, he wants us to be the Britain's best love winery, you know, because we're, we're a bit quirky, we're a bit um, different in our marketing, um, and uh, we're not pretending to be, you know, a super, super luxury brand. We don't have that budget. We can't, we couldn't keep that up, you know, we'd, they'd soon see through us. So that, that's, that's what we've gone for, um, and it's worked quite well so far. So, we're, you know, fingers crossed it continues to, to work quite well, yeah. So you almost uh, should create an adopt a winery uh, strategy, and uh, and and you be the favourite uh, yeah. for for the local market. So Emma, um, uh, New World wines uh, took uh, the UK by storm uh, a few decades ago, and and quickly grabbed 20, 25 percent of the market uh, with descriptive labelling which was nothing to do with the wine. It was all what you would do with it once you had a sip or two and what went with yep. what and what have you. What's your thought from a marketing perspective on, on, uh, on descriptive labelling? And that can only applies for wines, but, you know, other products. I think you have to do it now. Um, doesn't matter what your front label looks like. You can have as little information on your front label. In fact, I've got a great example of one. This, this is, um, I don't know whether you can see that. Yep. <laughs> Rastafarian character there, yep. So that's the front label. There's no yep. writing on it whatsoever, but it's got a lot of detail on the back. Yep. And that's important because people, you, everyone, if you look, go and just wander around a supermarket, wine department, everyone picks up a bottle and they immediately turn it over to read the back. They're, they're attracted by the front and then they read the back. So mm. you have to put information on there. You have to put um, detail about what the varieties are as long as they're recognisable ones, you know. Um, and I think that that, that assumption that the old world regions in France, Italy, Spain, that just with the region name or the, or the vineyard name on the front, the assumption that the customer, they're just gonna know, because of course, doesn't everybody know exactly what's in a bottle of Bordeaux or a bottle of Burgundy? Um, people don't, they, you know, they can't make that assumption anymore. So you have to put the information on the back and we, and we do. So you can play around as much as you like with the front label and that can, that can inspire someone to pick it up off the shelf, but you've got to give them something to make them follow through on the purchase. And they've got to think, oh, I want to try this. And it's not just a basic description. It's got to be some, we, I try and on the back of our labels, I, I write a little note from myself on every single different label we have why you know what was special about that vintage why we did this wine why we made it and um so that's i think that's really important now definitely great uh, great tips so emma uh, covid has been you know just a little story that snuck up into the news for <laughs> half a day uh in the last 18 months or so and you know you guys must have been hit as hard as just about anybody floating around what strategies did you put into place to try and overcome uh, your particular circumstances? Well, we were very worried in uh, April last year. So, because most of our business was through a wholesaler distributor based in London, in going out to restaurants, hotels, pubs, bars, etc., And that, that died overnight, of course. And then um, also uh, we were just making some serious inroads into the US market and we we actually shipped a container of wine out to the US the week before the lockdown happened. And needless to say, we haven't yet had to ship another one out there because their, their restaurant business went as well. It disappeared overnight. And that's where our forte was in terms of sales. Because you've got to persuade someone to spend that much money on a bottle of wine. You've got to have someone hand selling it pretty much. Um, oh, that's what we thought. That's what we always thought. But 
the pandemic just turned the world on its head, as, as we all know. So we re, I can't take any credit for this. I have to say it was uh, the commercial side of the business. I'm, I'm production. Um, so they uh, completely revamped the website, rewrote it, uh, made it much more user friendly for both the client, the customer and for us. So instead of, you know, we'd get 20 orders in on over a weekend and it would take us until Wednesday just to process them and ship them out. We can now, we get 150 orders, 200 orders in over a weekend and they're shipped out by 11 o'clock on a Monday morning. So just the difference in, we had to change the way we packed the wine. So instead of sending out pallets of a single wine, you know, 460 bottles on a, on a pallet um, of one wine, we were now doing mixed cases. So one of this, one of that. And God, I mean, all of us, I got in vans driving locally, delivering the, the owner, he, he came in and was doing deliveries. Um, we were all finance director, commercial director, down to the lowliest seller hand. We were all packing up mixed cases, you know, printing out labels. And we just we just got on with it and did it. Um, and, it and it made, it turned everything around. We went from 5% direct to consumer through website and seller door to over 30% overnight, sort of in within a month. Um, and it and it just saved saved our business completely um, and we're now maintain we're seeing it maintaining as well so it's it's amazing really I think what the key thing was that people who were never comfortable buying online and particularly not comfortable buying wine online they had no choice so we we adopted a, a social media strategy we um, had an advert a television advert that we filmed here in the winery and then it went on sky in the summer last year and just the the publicity we got from that, just because it was a, you know, the first English winery that's ever advertised on television, um, we, we've got this amazing response and, and we've maintained it. It's brilliant. So now we've just got to make sure we can maintain that consumer, direct to consumer market, while we're also getting back into restaurants. And if we can do that, then we're, you know, we're home free. So. Yeah. And probably out of that, the direct to consumer has far better margins than it is uh, working through a wholesaler or a distributor of some kind. It does have far better margins. The only thing about that is we now have a massive, massive um, duty and VAT bill that we have to pay to HMRC, which we never had because all our sales before were X VAT, X duty under bond. So, yeah. Um, so yeah, we now have to. It's a bit of a shock. The finance. I've just written a check for thirty thousand to HMRC. It's just like, well, we, we earned the money, so it's fine. But yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a bit of it's a whole new mindset um, we have to get used to. Brilliant, brilliant. Yeah. In Australia, and I know you had some time there, and that's where I'm from, obviously. And uh, we've got some great wine growing areas over there, Barossa Valley and Hunter Valley, and where I'm uh, born, up in the northeast of Victoria. They have winery tours, where you know busloads of people can get uh, then get some sample. Great marketing, but also great days out. I, I never see it. Well, it may be happening, but I never see it here in in uh, in England. Why is that? Well, we do do it. We do tours. They're by for us. They're by appointment. So, um, because and we do only do them on the weekend. So we don't. We can't really have forklifts buzzing about and people wandering about. So we keep the staff working Monday to Friday and the visitors on the weekends. Um, it's just safer that way and easier. Um, there are lots of there. Are, it's a big thing now. It's just starting to really happen. So you there's vineyards of Hampshire. There's the wine garden of England in Kent. Sussex, vineyards of Sussex, they're all starting to club together and bring these wine tours. But the crucial difference between, I don't know, Barossa Valley, Napa Valley and here is that, you know, the nearest vineyard to us here is, is five or six miles away. So whereas in Napa Valley, you literally go next door to the next one or, you know, you're on this, it's on the same road and it's, it's everything's close by and there are lots of wineries in one, six, um, one place. And so people can do a, a whole day they can spend a whole day going winery to winery so it is starting to happen a bit more but there's a lot more driving involved to get between the wineries here so you might just go to one winery for the day and then and, and then um, go home again or maybe get two in um, because otherwise you just be spending the whole day in the car yep <laughs> okay good uh, good reasoning so uh emma juniper based gin was becoming very fatigued and then all of a sudden, we've seen this explosion uh, taken on with the botanicals that are added to, and now we've got uh, gin distilleries popping up everywhere. Is there a similar opportunity on the horizon in the in the wine industry space? Uh, um, 
well, for a start, I wouldn't put botanicals in my wine. Anyway, let's get that clear. <laughs> um, the thing about wine is that we're so dependent on the weather each year uh, and we get one chance to make the wine. You know, you, with gin, you can make it, you can start again the next week and have another go. If you don't get it right, you just bin that and, and start again. And it's a very, very quick turnaround from, you know, in production, whereas our wines take years to, to come through. And you can't just change your vineyard either because, you know, a vineyard life is 25 years. You can't just dig up your vines and plant anymore. You can, but you're going to wait another 10 five to 10 years before they're, before they're ready to, um, you know, produce any wine for sale. So um, the one thing that we have done, and I, I think we're seeing more in England, is being a bit more innovative with what we've got. So making in, the, in 2020, for example, 2019, where we had some really ripe, sunny, we had really, really hot days and the grapes were really ripe, we started making some still wines, so rosé still rosé. It's half the price of the sparkling rosé because instead of it taking five years for it to be ready, it takes five months for it to be ready. So that's where we can save the money. The grapes cost the same. In fact, the grapes cost more because we're doing more to the vines to make them ripen the, the grapes faster. Um, but, but, you know, it's a much faster turnaround and it's much more um, approachable for the consumer to spend £15 than it is to spend £35 on a bottle of rosé. So that's one thing we're doing, and also um, doing making fizzy sparkling wine from unusual uh, base wines. So instead of the classic champagne-style wines, we've got um, a sparkling wine from Bacchus, which is an aromatic variety, and a sparkling wine made from red red Pinot Noir. So we make red wine and then make it sparkle. So not not nothing like the Barossa or the Australian sparkling Shirazes. Those are big, heavy wines. This is a very light uh, Pinot Noir that we've made fizzy. So that's what we're doing, being innovative with what we've got uh, and, uh, and, and grabbing the opportunities when we can, when the weather allows us to. I don't know that we'll be doing any of that this year because the weather is so awful so far. But yeah. you, think, you never know. So I call that being nimble and being agile rather than uh, uh, pivoting, which uh, is a, I hate the, hate the word. Oh, but, uh, I've tried to avoid using it at all, oh, <laughs> that word. Yeah. Because um, uh, I know on that subject in Australia years ago, and I'm talking quite a few years ago, they brought out this thing called Chateau de Cardboard, which was wine in a you know two, three, four litre cardboard a container that you had a little tap down the bottom like a little keg and consumed it like it was beer or something similar and and that was really popular but then all of a sudden it's died and I've seen recently here in the UK there's a company that's putting wine in a can. Oh and yeah that's definitely that's happening um, and there's no reason why it shouldn't be I mean it's not going to be the real high-end stuff but um, it's definitely a, a move away from heavy glass bottles um, Aluminium is infinitely recyclable, uh, so and it's lightweight. You get a small, you take it on a picnic. It's a small volume. Um, you don't need to have a separate glass. You don't need to have a bottle opener. You can just, you know, you can just um, crack the can and, and and drink it there and then. So yeah, that kind of thing is is becoming much more common, much more popular. Uh, I think we'll see more and more of it, but it's it's definitely on the um, at the at the moment. It's not the real high end wines. Um, with very good quality, but not sort of the really high end stuff. And also you've got to have a specialist um, canning facility as well. Most, most of us have invested heavily in bottling lines and things like that. We just, you know, the thought of having to start again from with a different, whole different process is uh, a bit daunting. So. Yeah, I can imagine. Mm -hmm. So Emma, a lot of businesses have had to compete with multinational bullies like Amazon and Booking.com and Diageo and whatnot. How do you deal with the so-called big boys that must uh, be some interesting stories you probably can't share here, but uh, um, how do <laughs> well, you deal I'll, with that? Well, I confess, I, I, I've used Booking.com myself and I've, I, I use Amazon, um, but if you can't beat them, you join them. So, you know, we've just launched on Amazon. So we, we now ship out couple of pallets to Amazon and in a, in a few weeks it will be available for next day delivery uh, you know maybe even same day delivery in London um, they've got fulfillment fulfillment capabilities that we can a case from us on a Saturday we're not we're not generally here so we won't dispatch it until Monday they won't get it till Tuesday 
Whereas on Amazon, if they order it on a Sunday night, they'll get it on the Monday morning. So, yeah, so if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> so uh, uh, what's uh, what's next on your agenda? What's uh, either where you are now or any other dreams, aspirations? When's the book coming out? Uh, all that sort of stuff. <laughs> I've already written the book on uh, English, how to, how to start a vineyard in England. Um, uh, it's not that I don't think that is on Amazon to be honest. <laughs> um, what do I see? I think, well, for me, I want to continue making the very best wine I can. I want to see it spread further and further across the world. I want it to become as well known as champagne. Um, I'm also very heavily involved in the generic body, which is Wines of Great Britain, um, to bring the whole industry sort of up to the because there's still a lot of you know amateur growers and um, very small companies they're not very commercial so you know to bring up to bring up the the standard of winemaking in the country up to um real professional commercial level and uh, take the wine world by storm um we'll continue to take the wine world by storm because we're already part of the way there brilliant brilliant and as far as the the hattingley valley operation is uh, is it going to expand how do people get hold of you can they come and visit uh, has the restrictions lifted what's how's that all going yeah we're back doing tours on the weekends and well private tours during the week sort of late afternoon early evening tours during the week if you want to book those uh, go to our website it's hattingleyvalley.com um take a look on there lots of things you know we're doing we do lots of special offers with our wines that we're selling as i say direct to consumer we are in a few um, shops like Waitrose and uh, lots of other places that you can buy online. Um, yeah, come and see us. Why not? I mean, get, have a day out. We're all allowed to now. And I think we're even allowed to take people inside now. So, <laughs> Brilliant. Emma Rice, it's been my pleasure to have you uh, on our program today. And for all the wine lovers out there, uh, I'm sure they've got uh, some interesting insights into the uh, into the operations and uh, thank you very much for your time and uh, we look forward to some uh, great interactions going forward thank you very much for being on the show well thank you very much for having me